Last December, Kim Jong-il's sudden death led to a lot of speculation regarding succession, whether or not it would be successful, whether or not this would bring instability to the regime and to the peninsula. However, we see no signs of that. The succession has been going much more smoothly than many people anticipated. And I think the, the reason for that is North Korea made a number of preparations for this that outside observ observers did not recognize. Um, we did see constitutional changes in 2009, some institutional arrangements, uh, the party conference in 2010 that revitalized the party and brought in a lot of people to uh, support this succession. So Kim Jong-il's death was sudden, however, it was not unexpected, and they had taken a number of uh, measures. Many people had speculated that Kim Jong-un was young and inexperienced, and of course, all transfers of power and all political systems are difficult, but in particular, uh, uh, authoritarian governments. Dictatorships are inherently unstable, but particularly at times of uh, power transfers. And, uh, but in North Korea, there are a number of factors that support this transition. The political institutions, the ideology, the barriers to any potential challengers who would like to uh, challenge the succession. And many people speculated that the senior generals would not take orders from such a young and uh, inexperienced man who just turned 29 in January. However, that assessment is based on the premise that their interests diverge. And I would argue the exact opposite, that in fact they, uh, their interests align. And so I ask people, if the generals were to uh, push out Kim Jong-un, then they would replace him with whom? Uh, the fact is, this is the exact guy they would like to have. Their policy preferences align. He's continuing the military first um, uh, line of North Korea. So I think we're seeing everyone uh, in the senior level, senior uh, uh, leadership, coalescing around the, the transition. And uh, all the signs out of Pyongyang point to that. Very recently, uh, U.S. and DPRK diplomats uh, announced a preliminary deal whereby North Korea will impose a moratorium on uh, long-range missile tests, nuclear tests, and other nuclear activities in exchange for nutritional assistance, for 240,000 tons of uh, nutritional assistance, and also for uh, the U.S. making a pledge or reaffirming that it does not have a hostile policy towards uh, North Korea. This is a preliminary agreement. The details still are, are being worked on. And even though many people had very high expectations or wanted to uh, say this is a big breakthrough, I think we have to be very cautious. The um, moratorium is reversible, very easily and immediately reversible. North Korea agreed to uh, maintain this moratorium for as long as the two sides are in dialogue to improve bilateral relations. So I think that's a strong incentive to get back to the table. Many people had um, scoffed at or um, kind of belittled North Korea, mocked North Korea for their test failures in, in the past. They've tried to uh, launch satellites. Uh, the satellite launchers failed. Their, their two nuclear tests were very low yield. However, we have to remember that every time they do these tests, it enables the engineers to go back and fix these problems. All countries who have developed these types of weapon systems have to go through these engineering hurdles. So uh, for as long as we keep these uh, caps on, on testing, it serves the international security. I think it's a good thing to do this. And of course, we're very concerned about a possible uh, proxy test. By North Korea could conduct a test and share the test data with North Iran, for example. So those are the kind of things that we really want to prevent. So I think it was important that they got this preliminary agreement, but we'll see how the details are worked out and if this leads to a longer process and sustainable process of denuclearization. Thank you.